When it comes to the space competition between China and the United States, it is a critical topic that is discussed, unfortunately, either with a significant ideological bias or simply not discussed at all. People around the world generally admire the Chinese capability to catch up with the United States in technology, but no one really understands why China is able to do so. How does the CNSA function, and why is the Chinese launch program so secretive? Without further ado, let's dissect this today, starting with the Chinese launch vehicle capabilities. First of all, Chinese launch vehicles are world class. Chinese launch vehicles are called the Long March, named after the military retreat undertaken by the Red Army. In history, the Long March was a consequential and nirvana moment for the Communist Party of China, the CCP. The Red Army, under the eventual commander Mao Zedong, escaped in an encircling retreat to the west and north, which reportedly traversed over 9,000 kilometers over 370 days. Over half of the Red Army died along the way, either fighting with the Nationalist Army or due to the terrible conditions. So the name Long March suggests the long and strenuous journey ahead to develop the Chinese space programs and also the optimism for its eventual success. Over the years, many Long March vehicles were built. Here is a rundown of their specs. In terms of their capability, small launch vehicles are Long March 6 and Long March 11. For heavy launch, there are Long March 2F, Long March 3 series, Long March 4 series, Long March 5 series, Long March 7 series, and Long March 8 series. For super heavy launch though, which is an equivalent of Starship, it's still in development, which is Long March 9. It is planned to be fully reusable with a LEO launch capability of 140 ton. Here's how the vehicle look in comparison. As you can see, the two vehicles that do most heavy lifting for China's space missions are Long March 3 series and Long March 5 series both of which come with side boosters. Here are China's launch vehicle development in chronological order. From Long March 1 to Long March 11, the development took over 50 years while China's space capabilities slowly built up. The naming convention denotes the sequence of which the project was initiated, not when it was finalized. That's why you see the super heavy lift launch vehicle Long March 9's development will finish at around the mid to late 2020s, while Long March 11 is already operational. Long March 9, the planned super heavy equivalent from China, is the next generation 100 ton capability vehicle China is building. And reportedly, the Chinese are also going to make Long March 9 reusable, so that is competitive to Starship. China is working on the vertical landing capability with Long March 8 right now. Since the Chinese already possess the technology to land rovers on the moon, it is a matter of time before China becomes the second country to land rockets like the United States SpaceX. This is my assessment. Now, the Chinese Space Agency's objective. According to CNSA's website, it has eight categories of offerings as shown in the image here. From top left to bottom right, they are launchers, satellite products, landers and rovers, spacecraft, deep space exploration, high resolution earth observation system, manned space flight, and Beidou satellite navigation systems. The icons are quite self-explanatory. According to CNSA's white paper, China's space activities in 2016, its key objective is to explore outer space and enhance understanding of the earth and the cosmos, to utilize outer space for peaceful purposes, promote human civilization and social progress, and benefit the whole of mankind. To meet the demand of economic, scientific, and technological development, national security and social progress, and to improve the scientific and cultural levels of the Chinese people, protect China's national rights and interests, and build up its overall strength. But if I were to boil down everything here into three key points, there are essentially three objectives for CNSA. That number one, it is about building a community with a shared future for mankind. And number two, it is about upholding China's national security and developmental right. And number three, enhancing the understanding of Earth and the cosmos. At first glance, none of these points have any malign intentions, and they don't. But if you look at those goals, all of them take roots from a bigger meta-idea called 
geoeconomics. Though politicians like to make it political and even call these competitions of national security, it is in fact about economic interests at a national level. When one country's principal economic sector directly competes with that of another country, governments become the chief protagonist in the competition, not companies. China and the United States have tremendous mutual interests, but the competition in technology is very obvious. Moreover, what makes Chinese space capability most formidable is the way Chinese space agencies operate brutally efficient and result-oriented. A major difference between China and the United States is that most rocket manufacturers I mentioned from China today would be state-owned enterprises rather than privately owned corporations like in the United States in the case of Boeing or Lockheed Martin, which means Chinese agency is subordinate to the wills of the leadership of the Communist Party of China and their allocation of funding. Though it's a public-private partnership in the United States, if you really look at the, the way Congress operates in the US, it's actually similar to the Chinese way of working. Under the Chinese system, the defense industry is funded by the state and is under the direct influence of the state actors. CNSA, China's equivalent of NASA, is directly supervised by the Chinese Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, which is led by the State Council of China. The head of the State Council in China is Premier Li Keqiang. So the head of CNSA is directly appointed by the State Council and CPC, which means his boss is Premier Li and the President Xi. In the United States, NASA's director is appointed by the President of the United States, and NASA's funding is appropriated by the US Congress. So really, if you look at how China and the US uh, operates in terms of the space agencies, they're similar as well. Furthermore, the manufacturer of the Chinese Long March rocket is a state-owned enterprise called Chinese Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, which is owned by the state, as the name suggests. CASC's president and directors are appointed by the CPC and the state council as well, but they are usually engineers and managers with a track record of working in the same field throughout their lives. For instance, Wu Yansheng, the current president and chairman of CASC, graduated from Tsinghua University with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and joined CASC in his early 20s. He rose to become a lead engineer, manager, director, and finally in 2014, he was appointed to be the president of CASC. His career in CASC took 25 years. And my point is, many mainstream media would tell you that China's state-owned enterprises are extremely inefficient, which is true, but still, we need to understand that at an individual level, the company is led by competent engineers and managers, with a bit of a hint of bureaucracy. On a group level, however, state-owned enterprises had been inefficient and bureaucratic. But since the 1990s, SEO reforms have encouraged less state influence to ensure efficiency, so in terms of business structure, it is operated as a private business. This is a system that is designed for results. No bullshit presentations, speeches, or hearings, no glamorous launch events, just brutal rationality. And make no mistake, it is about China's national interest and what CPC calls people's right to development. The Chinese are not going to be anyone else's lackey, and they're demanding a seat at the top negotiation table, and they want to make the rules.